In today's America, the mass media dominates the narrative. Often, these narratives are often silenced, silencing the underrepresented communities, portraying perspectives based solely on fear and misunderstanding. With these communities, they include the 800,000 dreamers, waiting in line, in limbo, <laughs> uncertain about their future because they're not sure their DACA permits will be there tomorrow. The document that lets them go to school, go to work legally, pay taxes they don't benefit from, and question whether or not a pathway to citizenship will ever exist for them. The media likes to choose to prey on our fears. We need a wall. They're stealing our jobs. They don't contribute. They don't pay taxes. They should just wait in line and come here legally, like everyone else. With such negative narratives being told and believed, it's no surprise that so many people from these immigrant communities don't dare to speak out or clarify their narrative because they're afraid to draw attention onto themselves or cause trouble or risk their families and friends' lives. With such negative narratives, how do we reclaim our own? How do we turn that around? I'm Yoselin Riojas, a Latina artist and activist. My artwork primarily focuses on women empowerment, cultural identity, and immigration issues. I grew up in the small town called Eagle Pass in southwest Texas on the border, just, <laughs> just a short walk across the bridge to the country of Mexico where I was born. Some of those earliest memories of me growing up as a child was skipping kindergarten with my mother, y mi abuelita, to travel out of town to chase clients down, knocking at their doors to help them fix their legal status and their paperwork. And some of those memories include the building of this iron wall or fence that cuts through the backyards of people's homes. It's long now become this permanent fixture in our landscape that we don't question it anymore. Long on those bridge whenever I go crossing, now these days it's common to see lines of adults and children holding on to what little belongings they have because they're seeking asylum from a country who might be violent, <laughs> escaping all these dangers, but with no hope of ever crossing onto American soil. Growing up in this environment, my little hometown, I never had to question my sense of identity, my privilege, or my flawed tongue until I left that little town to university. When I got to university, it was very early on that culture shock started to set in. And most days, whenever I would walk into a room, I would find myself hoping and praying in there, like, ay, Diosito, please <laughs> let there be someone in there that looks like me. <laughs> but very rarely did those moments ever happen. There was other moments when people would like to come up to me because they would hear how I would speak, because my accent would like to slip out on occasion, and it would cause them to ask, is that how you really speak, or are you joking? Usually followed with the, I guess if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> As someone homesick for her culture and her community, little did I know that years later my art would have this ability to create a safe haven for those seeking refuge in a country with a political climate that makes them question their place in America and within their own communities. As an activist, some of the first things I learned from <laughs> all my mentors was, remember, it's not about changing the public's mind. It's about changing the community that you're working with. It's about learning to have a sense of empathy, to be able to see from that person's point of view, to be able to listen to understand that person's struggle, to be able to help them speak their truth. In other words, you have to learn to leave your privilege at the door, no matter your ethnic background, your level of education, your prestige in society, or whatever money you have to donate. And that applies to everyone, including me. Because at the end of the day, the oppressed will always be the ones who are best equipped to educate and share their story and narrative. 
So by now, you're probably already thinking, okay, well, this girl sounds like a real social justice warrior. <laughs> and it's true, I'm that girl who will go to your party or your family's carne asada and be like, hey, que onda? <laughs> are you registered to vote? <laughs> okay, dope. <laughs> yes. But don't worry, because I'm not here to change your mind or decide with me on a certain issue. I'm here to educate you, to teach you about how art is this social tool that we can use to inspire, to create social change and cultural resistance. It has this ability to connect to people at an emotional level and break these language barriers that words just can't simply reach. Art is a social tool that creates self-reflection. It helps build these, these communities, helps inspire us, it helps motivate us to act. Growing up, as this young Latina little girl, I always wondered, well, what's my path? What's next? For me, there's always a lot of questions about, well, what can I do? How can I use my voice? But a lot of the time, as women of color, and I'm sure many of us out there can relate, we're always taught to be passive with our voices to stay out of the sun because we don't want to get too dark, because that's not what pretty girls do. To stay out of issues that you don't understand, to let the men handle things. Well, for me, obviously, I didn't listen. <laughs> 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 I didn't want to grow up just to have that traditional family, have a job, have your kids, which none of it is bad. But in a world lacking in representation, I didn't want my story to end there because nobody told me I could do more. And if your parents are anything like mine, I'm sure they'll tell you stories. I didn't work as a migrant worker in those fields just for you to struggle. Your dad didn't go to university with his little suitcase filled with his little belongings and chorizo and tortillas for you to struggle. <laughs> well, the first time when I finally was able to grow out of that mindset where I had that freedom to be able to speak my truth, be able to feel free to voice my concerns, whether it's at home or the public, I went to this protest against SB4, and if you don't know, it's an anti-immigrant legislative bill. I had heard about this group of young Latinas who were involved with this organization called JOLT, focused on building a collective voice for Latinos. I heard they were planning to take over this capital and protest in their old quinceanera gowns, <laughs> a dress that celebrates their cultural identity and them becoming women at the age of 15. They took advantage of this strong visual representation to gain the attention of national media news outlets. To be able to voice their concerns over this bill known as SB4, that's also known as the Show Me Your Papers bill. They used that moment to reclaim their narrative and to say, I'm here too, and I'm just as American as you. Seeing those young Latinas step out in protest at the capital of all places in Austin, inspired me to take my art out of my private space and out of my social media, which little did I know would become the beginning of my journey into creative resistance. Shortly after the SB4, or Quince Contra SB4 protest, I was invited to join Jolt as his resident, art, resident artist to keep on learning and working on how art can be used as a social tool for creative resistance, how we can inspire and unite our communities to come together with these strong visual representations that highlight our community in a good way, because as people of color, we don't always see it. It was on September 5th, 2017. It was announced that DACA was set to expire, again placing these young dreamers in limbo uncertain about what's going to happen after that expiration date, whether they'll even make a decision by early March 2018. So, as a resident artist, 
they came up to me and they kind of put me up to this challenge. We're going to place you with these volunteers. You guys are going to come together to take this moment to reclaim it as your own, to celebrate your culture, to celebrate your community, to celebrate the fight, then rather mourn the possible expiration date that's coming. Thus, I was placed with this group of acquaintances of all sorts, all from different backgrounds, architecture, graphic design, painting, writing, analytics, and so forth, as you can imagine. Just a group of Latinos of all ages coming together to share this certain passion. But how do we come up with a proposal? What creative campaign do we do to celebrate our fight rather than mourn this? Well, with my designer brain, I was like, you know what? Working with a group of people, it's always awkward. Nobody wants to talk to each other. We're all strangers. So I came up with a 20-card piece game system that I like to call creative acts of resistance. It was to help us come up with this solution to help us communicate more efficiently, share ideas, not be afraid and share this common ground where we can all feel free to speak, where we can ask the right questions. What's your purpose? What's your message? What are you trying to do and who are you trying to reach? Well, together we came up with this idea. We're going to build this public art installation in the shape of monarch butterfly wings. And you're probably wondering, well, why a monarch of all things? Well, within the resistance community, the monarch butterfly has become this symbol, this symbol of migration and resilience. If you didn't know, the monarch butterfly takes about five generations to travel across the border, free from borders from Mexico to the US and up north, just to reach its final destination, no matter the obstacles. That same, that same day, on September 5th, 2017, I was inspired to draw this illustration that you see above me. An Afro-Latina with her hair up in the air and the message, my dreams are not illegal, surrounded by these monarch butterflies. It started a buzz online. After the Women's March took notice of it and shared her across social media, there started this whole debate about what an immigrant looks like to the public. Everybody was so confused by her. A lot of the commentaries or comments made, I guess, were, I thought all illegal immigrants were Mexican. Why does everything need to be black? Always. <laughs> it made us question, well, what faces does the media choose to focus on? And what faces is it neglecting? For others? This image, this simple image that just highlights them in a positive light, it created this safe space for positive representation, a new identity they could connect with, no matter her dark skin complexion, no matter what her identity is. It gave them hope. With her image still in my mind, I worked together with my friends at Jolt we put together this proposal to design that public art installation. It came out to be about the size of seven feet tall to seven feet wide. You can only imagine her size. It was designed by our architect, Jesus Valdez. We wanted to just have people be able to embody, embody that symbol of the monarch. But after months of planning, and hiring outside help to build the wooden frame and the steel, the steel bar frame that holds it, we held this community art day to let others join in in the creation, because it's not about just us, the people who thought about this, who came up with this crazy proposal to build this sculpture. I illustrated the wings and our Afro-Latina with the message, my dreams are not illegal again, to give her another place to share in the, with the world. Edith Valle, our painter, that day, she mixed the paints for the colors we needed. It was a day of healing, conversation, and community building. We wanted to create this installation, this interactive public art installation, with the purpose of people being able to stand between her wings, to embrace that message, migration is sweet. And if, if you pay attention closer to the little circles around her wings, those are conchas, also known as Mexican sweetbread. 
we hit them there. You guys are probably thinking that's cute. <laughs> but here's the thing. We put them there with reason, with purpose. As the message to say, you love my culture, but you don't love me. With early March coming and the expiration DACA coming up and who knows what the government was to decide, we held an event where we would reveal this public art installation at the capital of Texas in Austin, in the South Steps. We gave this moment to have dreamers come up to the stage, to stand in front of her wings, to give her a moment, to sh share a moment of empowerment, to celebrate her identity, to let them know, this is my story and this is why it's important. This is why it needs to be heard. Here's the thing, though. It was never about building this public art installation to share with everybody. It was about using this form of creative resistance to show our support to these people who need it, to help them uplift their voice when nobody else would listen, to let them reclaim their narrative. I hope you all have been inspired today to get more motivated within your own communities to learn to see from another person's point of view, to be able to listen to that person, to understand their struggle, to help them be able to speak their truth and uplift their voice and amplify it. Tu lucha es mi lucha. Your struggle is my struggle. Thank you.